and uh, thank you everybody for making uh, taking your time to be here this evening it's once again a great joy coming together in the presence of god and studying the word together it's always a joy so i really want to thank all of you i know that uh, you had a very busy day today but yet though your minds are tired your physic is tired physically you are tired but uh, you want to be in the presence of god studying god's word together so i really appreciate that and i hope these studies are being useful to you and i because whatever i am sharing whatever passage i'm sharing i'm trying to do that verse by verse study but unfortunately we are not going to take up the whole book of uh, revelation entire book and all the chapters because of the limitation of time that we have i am not taking the entire book but i am going to deal with some of the major chapters from the book of uh, revelation so that uh, we will have a glimpse of the whole book and we will not miss any important truths that we are supposed to learn from the book of uh, revelation so today we we are going to look at the second chapter of revelation as you all know last time we have completed our first chapter we have completed our first chapter and uh, the first chapter we have dealt it in two parts as you all know we have dealt it in two parts uh, first 11 verses uh, we have uh, dealt it in the first place and then later we took up the second part of the first chapter so that way we looked at both the the revelation of the lord jesus christ so whenever we are talking about the book of revelation it is nothing but the revelation of the lord jesus christ basically so how the lord revealed to the church how the lord revealed to all of us revealing to all of us today and that's what uh, we have been studying and we've been looking at and uh, now from the second chapter onwards second and third chapters we see the information about the seven churches that john mentions in this book the seven churches so that's what we are going to look at but i am not going to see i am not going to deal with the all the seven churches but uh, only two churches i will deal Uh, that is the church of smyrna and the church of laodicea but today we will only look at the church in smyrna uh, because these two churches are very very important for us to know and uh, they will be uh, somewhat applicable more applicable to the present age so that's the reason why i am picking up those two churches for our study sake but as we all know that uh, we have looked into the whole book of ephesians or uh, sorry the whole book of revelation and we said that the first chapter is about the revelation second and third chapters talks about the churches the fourth and the fifth chapter talks about the scene in heaven and from the sixth chapter till the 18th chapter we see the tribulation period uh, after the church has been raptured what happens in the tribulation period which will be for the seven years of period that's mentioned in the 6th chapter onwards till the 18th chapter and then the 19th chapter we see the lord coming down uh, with his saints and also we see the thousand years of reign of the lord jesus christ and the 20th chapter we see the judgment the uh, great uh, white throne judgment and then finally we go into 21st and 22nd chapter we deal with the new heaven and a new earth Uh, that will be the end of the entire book that's how the book is been divided as you all know so today we are looking at the the seven churches that have been revealed to us the seven churches that have been revealed to us today so we are going to look at that so what do we learn about these seven churches as i already told you these seven churches are mentioned in the second chapter and the third chapter of revelation 
and uh, they are all presently in Turkey. All the seven churches are in Turkey. The names that are mentioned are in Asia Minor, which is presently the Turkey that we are looking at in the map, in the world map. If you see, we can see that. So there are three things we should know about the seven churches. The seven churches are the literal churches. It's not a story. It is not an imaginary thing that the Lord is talking about. It is the literal churches the Lord is talking about. They're all there. They're all there in the first century. Look at the map. They're all there. So they're all been given like this uh, in the, the map in the Asia Minor. And on the left side of the map, if you see, there is a Aegean Sea. It's called Aegean Sea. It's on the border of the Aegean Sea. We can see all the seven churches in a clockwise direction. The clockwise direction, the Lord is speaking Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira, and the Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So all these are there, uh, literal churches. And the second fact about the churches is, we talk about, uh, when we talk about these churches, we need to understand that they are spiritual in relevance. They are spiritual in relevance. That means each church has got something to do with us as believers today. Something to apply to us as believers today. So there is a spiritual relevance, uh, uh, relevance uh, in all the churches uh, to us today. So that's one important thing that we need to learn. And the third thing that we look at these seven churches is there is a historical uh, significance in all the seven churches. That means each church represents a period of church history, a different period of church history. So that there is a historical significance given uh, for all the seven churches. How are they being given? Now look at the, uh, the stages of the seven churches in the church history. If you look at the church history, this is how these churches have been uh, seen uh, what is mentioned in the book of Revelation. So the first church, the Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, uh, we see that in 33 to 100 AD. You know, when we talk about 33 AD, the date, I'm talking about the date. That is the time when the Holy Spirit was given in the early church. And that was the time the early first church was formed. The first church was formed then. In the AD 33, the first church was formed. So we need to understand after the uh, resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, during this period, the 33 to 100, during that time, the Holy Spirit was given and the early church was formed. So that's the reason why I'm telling that all the churches has got some symbolic uh, or symb uh, symbolic significance in the church history. So this is how the churches are being divided according to the A, according to the date. The Smyrna, we see that it's a persecuted church between the 100 and 313 AD. And Pergamos, we see that compromising church. Theotira, corrupted church. Sardis, reformation, the church of reformation, we call it. And Philadelphia, we say it's a church of awakening. And then Laodicea, it is the present church we are in. The church that we belong to today, that is what the Laodicea church is all about. So today, as I told you, I will be dealing with the second church, uh, the Smyrna. And the next week, I'll be dealing with the Laodicea, the church in Laodicea. We are not going to look at the, all the seven churches, unfortunately, because of lack of time, I told you. We will be looking at only Smyrna and Laodicea. But before, before we go to the church in Smyrna, I would like to give you some more information about these seven churches. What do we see in these seven churches? As I told you last time, there are seven similarities of these seven letters. Similarities are there. What is the similarity? All these letters begin with a special title of Jesus. So every church has got a title that is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the similarity. And all the churches are being addressed to the angel. As I already told you last week, Angelos, we call it. In Greek, we call it Angelos. Angelos means messenger. 
uh, when when the letter says address to the angel to the angel of ephesus to the angel of smyrna it does not mean the spirit being the lord is not writing a letter to the spirit being it is the messenger of that church which means the pastor of the church the lord is writing to so all the letters are been written to the pastors of those churches the particular churches so that's what we need to understand but then again we see all these churches the letters begin with jesus knowing their deeds so in every church we see that i know your deeds the lord says i know your deeds i know your deeds so every church we see that it begins like that every church so that's another similarity we see in a letter and then if you look at very carefully all these churches either they have a commendation or they have a complaint or they have a reward or sometimes both the commendation and complaint commendation means appreciation so there are certain churches which are appreciated for the life that they lived for the deeds that they have and then there are also complaints about certain churches the lord had to give and otherwise in some churches we have both both the appreciation and both the complaint and and the complaint both are there in some churches but then there is another similarity in these churches all these churches all these churches if you look at all the letters they all close with uh, something to do with the second coming of the lord something to do with the second coming of the lord that's very interesting to note all the churches and then all the churches all the letters they close with a special promise or a reward to the overcomer so if you look at the every church at the end of every church letter we see that there is a reward given you know those who did something those who kept the promise there is a reward for the overcomer so these are some of the uh, similarities of all the letters then in all the letters we see the letters end he who has an ear let him hear uh, this is the phrase that ends every letter ends with this phrase he who has an ear let him hear so it's a very very important that when jesus is writing to the pastors of the church through them the letter has to go to the congregation and jesus wants everybody to know and to hear to listen and to obey what the lord is telling to the to those churches so that's how they we can see uh, certain similarities uh, of the letters and then as i told you they are real real churches they are realistic churches they are there today and today there is a modern name given for all these churches the modern name that is given to these churches are like this the ephesus is no more called as ephesus but it is called as selsak selsak is the today's name if you go to turkey today uh, the same ephesus is called Sel selsak selsak and smyrna is called izmir pergamos is called bergama and theatira is called akisa sardis is called sart philadelphia is called alasahir lydia or neo caesarea and then laodicea is called as latakia latakia so these are some of the greek names given to the modern name, modern church i mean to the churches today the modern church these are the modern names uh, with all the churches they have that day so which means that they are real if you go to turkey you can see all these places all these names are mentioned in turkey today and then if you look at one by one each church i want to give you some outline of the churches uh, one by one and then later we will take up the smyrna the church in smyrna so if you take ephesus uh, it's a loveless church you know we already know that uh, the lord says that you have forgotten the first love you have forgotten the first love god says so that means to remember god is telling them to remember to repent and to repeat certain things which you have done earlier so there are three instructions given to the church in ephesus remember what you have done where you are today and repent repent of your deeds repent of the forgetness uh, or forgetfulness of the love and then the repeat what you have been doing earlier and now you are not doing you better repeat it again so that's this is how 
the letter goes and the instructions goes to the church then when it comes to the church in smyrna it is a suffering church basically i will talk about it today in detail i will talk about that in detail and there are two instructions given to this church based on the church that is going through the situation the church is in because the believers are going through suffering the lord gives two instructions to the church one is be fearful and second one is be faithful so these are the two instructions given to the church which we will look at in details about the church uh, in a moment later in few minutes later we will look at that and then when you come to uh, the third church pergamos it's a compromising church it's a compromising church we call it uh, pergamos and uh, they've been uh, holding on to some false teachers all that is there so the lord is trying to instruct the church saying that you should maintain a distinct identity that's what the lord wants the church to keep that in mind you should maintain a a particular identity uh, as a christian as believers you know if you look at second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 verses 8 onwards remember jesus christ raised from the dead descended from david this is my gospel and uh, for which i am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal but god's word is not changed therefore i endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may be obtain the salvation that is in christ jesus with eternal with eternal glory this is what uh, the, the the lord is telling to uh, the pergamos church that we need to keep up that identity as the servants of god as the children of god willing to suffer for him don't be compromising with the world don't be compromising with the untruth with the lies which is not the truth don't be compromising with that and he says because of the suffering because of the gospel i am in chains paul says i am in chains today and then we need to speak in love and he is also instructing that the church has to uh, speak in uh, speak the truth in love and then also we need to be growing in love in efficiency and then finally uh, he is also talking about our role our role as you know reconcile reconcilers our role as reconcilers of the worldly people to the lord so these are some of the instructions given to the church in pergamos if you look at carefully and then coming back to the church in thyatira it's a, there is a threat of discipline given to that it's a rebellious rebellious church so when when the church is rebellious god has to discipline the church so there are certain things given to the church as a discipline and uh, the lord says to the church you know if you look at uh, the revelation chapter 2 revelation chapter 2 and uh, verse 22 says something like this so i will cast her on the bed of suffering and i will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely until they repent of her ways so this is a part of the discipline the lord says i will put them into suffering because they are not listening to me they are very rebellious and i have to teach them few lessons so god does that you know out of love he does that and uh, there is also a, a threat given to them they say that i will strike her children dead in 23rd verse and then uh, all the churches will know that i am who searches hearts and minds and i will repay each one of you according to your deeds so this is one of the threats and instructions given to the church if you look carefully and there is also a message given to the church and there are message to the conquerors at the end uh, we see all that instructions to the church in thyatira which is a rebellious church and then coming back to the church in sardis uh, we see that uh, the church in sardis uh, it is a dead church and the lord very clearly says you know you act as if you are alive but you are dead it's a church of hypocrisy you know that's what it is be sensitive to sin and be sense to be supportive to the faithful be submissive to the holy spirit that's what some of the instructions were given to the church and be subjective to the authority of god's word and uh, then he also says be sorry and repent you need to repent of your if your ways repent of your behavior repent of your deeds 
That's what the Lord says here. So there are certain very important instructions given to the church at this level. And then coming back to uh, the Philadelphia, it's a faithful church. I will show you in a moment later, uh, what is the specialty about this Philadelphia? And there are uh, a few other churches also. Uh, there are two more churches that there is a something special about those churches. I will show you in a moment later. And uh, there is the, what is the instruction given? Uh, there is a potentiality. There is a potentiality in the church. So the Lord is asking the church to avail the opportunities, avail the opportunities for the ministry. And uh, the people in the local church are really good and they are faithful and they want to do something for the Lord. And there are certain principles given to the local church. And uh, there is an instruction saying that you better use all the opportunities that you have uh, in order to glorify God, in order to grow spiritually in him. So these are some of the basic instructions given to the church in uh, Philadelphia. And then we come back to the church in Lavadesia. It is called the lukewarm church. As I told you, the Lavadesia church is the present church that we are in. So we belong to this Lavadesian period, Lavadesian period, the present age, the present, present age that we are in, we are all in whatever church we belong to, we are in the Lavadesian age, we call it. So most of the churches we, we see today are lukewarm churches. And that's why there is an instructions given to these churches. And we will look at this church next week in a very, very detailed, in a detailed way, we will look at this. And the Lord says, what are the instructions given here? A spiritual blindness is there. Spiritual nakedness is there. Spiritual poverty is there. Spiritual compromise is there. And Christlessness also we see in the church. So don't worry. I will be dealing with this next week in detail about this Lavadesia church. So these are a basic some of the instructions that we see. And then when you look at these seven churches... There are three impo important components in all these seven churches. What are the three important components we see in all these seven churches? There is a complaint. There is a commendation or appreciation. And there is a reward. Every church has got a complaint, a commendation. That means appreciation or a reward. For those who kept up the promise, who are victorious, overcomers, there is a reward given. So, these are three important components we see in every church. So if you really want to make a tabla form, <laughs> tabla form of the entire seven churches, this is how we can make a tabla form. This is how you can do a tabla form. Look at this now. Uh, we can write it like this, a tabla form. In the first column, you can say church. In the second column, you write about the complaint. And in the third column, you talk about the commendation or appreciation and in the fourth column you see a reward you see a reward and very interestingly if you look at these seven churches uh, look at the circles that are put now and uh, in the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia there is no complaint at all there is no complaint whatsoever what a wonderful thing that is to note down and uh, and if you look at the Lavadesia there is no commendation. That's a sad part. <laughs> there is no appreciation for that church. But the, all the other churches have some appreciation or other. Appreciation is there for all the others. But if you look at Lavadesia, that's the only church that does not have any appreciation. Look at this, friends. You know, there are churches which has no complaints, a couple of churches. And there is one church that has no appreciation. No appreciation. What a sad thing. And today, when we look at our own churches, local churches, may it be Baptist Church, Lutheran Church, Assemblies of God, CSI, CNI, whatever church that you belong to, Pentecostal, whatever church that you belong to, all these churches are now come under Lavadesian period. They come under the Lavadesian period. So when we are talking about the Lavadesian period, is my church, we need to question like this, is my church a lukewarm church today? spiritually poor, blind and naked today. Does my church have any appreciation or not from the Lord? This is what we want to look at it. We want to look at it and, and apply and see how best we can, you know, change some of the 
you know some of the things that are happening in the church today and uh, you can you can see the whole uh, whole you know the chart here that i have put up uh, on the screen here whole chart which will give you an overall picture of the seven churches and in the first column when you write the church name you can even write the references there so supposing you are talking about efficient church you can say from first to seven verses from first to seven verses uh, first cha second chapter from first verse to seven verses it's efficient church and in the same manner you can tell to smirna also you can write from the 11th verse to uh, from the 8th verse to 11th verse something like that so look at the bible look at your bible and you can write the references also in the first column so and then later if you divide up the entire seven churches it will be something like this this is a birds eye view i call it i call it a birds eye view of all the seven churches uh, probably i have already prepared the notes now for the first chapter i have prepared the notes already i'm going to give it to brother yoke uh, the notes is ready today i'll give it to him and so that he will pass it on to all of you uh, the notes will be given to all of you so if any one of you are attending the bible study today for the first time kindly leave your phone number your name and if you have any email id please leave it in the chat box that will be of great help to us uh, we can send the notes to you i can and we can also inform uh, of the further studies that we are going to have so this is an overall picture of the uh, seven churches then something that i want to talk before i talk about the smyrna church uh, signs of no revival supposing if you are looking at your own church today and you say that my church do not have any revival my church is not revived it is a dead dead church what shall i do what shall i do you know something like that you are looking at your church and saying first of all we need to see what are the signs of uh, the church with no revival if the church does not have any revival how does the church will be uh, we can say some of the signs are like this the church is very nominal when i say the church is nominal which means that all the members of the church are not born again they they are just nominal christians they are born in christian families but they are not they have not received jesus christ as their personal savior they are more liberal they come to sunday to the church and they get indulged in all kinds of worldly activities uh, the rest of the week so they are very liberal and then the elders of the church are not born again this is a sign of no revival the sign of no revival and in the churches where there is no revival you can see that the word of god is not given importance to it the word of god is not given importance and you can see very monotonous worship nobody will enjoy and some people will be even sleeping when the songs are being sung and that's the reason why today many of the young people don't come don't attend the churches because they don't like the worship they don't like the songs that they sing very orthodox old fashioned songs some of the churches sing and they are not at all applicable to the present generation and there is no life in the singing there is no life in the singing you can sing orthodox songs i mean old songs very good hymns are there very powerful hymns are there very anointed hymns are there if you look at the oldest hymns they are very good but until and unless the church is been filled by the holy spirit you cannot see a revival you cannot see a spirit filled worship happening there so that's one problem in the no revival church and there is also no spiritual edification for the members of the church there is no spiritual edification so what do i mean the members come to the church but they don't get any spiritual food <laughs> as such a spiritual food they don't get in some of the mainline churches if you go you can see that the 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 message time is only very short 15 minutes or 10 minutes sometimes they maximum 20 minutes you know so the whole week uh, the people stay at home and they come back to the church and what is the pastor giving to the entire members for the rest of the week to meditate upon to live upon what is the message that the pastor is trying to give if you only have a 10 minutes message what is that you can really give so there is no 
spiritual edification as such for the members of the church and in the churches where there is no revival you can also see there are misplaced priorities misplaced priorities they don't give priority to the lord they don't give priority to the word they don't give priority to the prayer they don't give priority to the spiritual things they don't give priority to the fasting they don't give priority to the work of the holy spirit there are some things like that so the priorities are misplaced priorities are misplaced and then finally you see in the churches where there is no revival you see that the worldly methods creep into the church the worldly methods creep you know it is not the worldly methods that can really strengthen a spiritual church a spiritual church needs biblical methods biblical methods not the worldly methods we need to remember that so if some of you sitting here or in the committee in your church committee please remember this make sure the the worldly systems the worldly thinking the worldly pattern should not come into the churches today if you can be sure of that you can see a greater revival taking place in your church today so that's one these are some of the very important things that i want you to note it down before we get into the church in smyrna so now we are coming to the church in smyrna as i told you uh, the present modern name for the church in smyrna is izmir izmir is the present modern name and this is the city that looks like this but the present city looks like this and uh, with this uh, the the church in smyrna is been uh, uh, mentioned in revelation chapter 2 and verse 8 to 11 at this moment i want one of you to please unmute and one of you please read from your bible from verse 8 to verse 11 one of you please read any version that is okay you please read it in english um revelation chapter 2 verses 8 to 11 any one of you please unmute and read revelation second chapter verses beginning from 8 to 11 and to the angel of the church in smyrna write these things says the first and the la and the last who was dead and came to life i know your works tribulation and poverty but you are rich and i know the blasphemy of those who say they are jews and are not but are a synagogue of satan do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer indeed the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days be faithful until death and i i will give you the crown of life he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death uh, thank you brother that was that was very clear reading i really appreciate that so we are going to look at this uh, uh, church in smyrna and as i already told you uh, the eighth verse it is addressing to the angel angel of the church i already mentioned angel means not the spirit being not a real angel it is the messenger angelos we call it in greek we call it angelos which means a messenger we, that means messenger means the one who takes the message to the church today we can say it's a pastor the pastor of that church in smyrna that's what the lord is telling that to john give to this church the city of smyrna very interestingly is founded by the alexander the great <laughs> that's a very interesting uh history that you want to know it's founded by the alexander the great there is a major commercial seaport in this city uh that means it's a trading center and here there is a famous product produced uh in smyrna that is called myrrh myrrh if you look at myrrh i think you will easily remember what myrrh is myrrh is taken from the shrubs it is a perfume kind of a thing and the moment i told you about myrrh i am sure you must you must have 
thought about Jesus birth when the three wise men came they came with the gold frankincense and myrrh one of them brought the myrrh also so uh, it has it is famous for this uh, a famous product called myrrh and it is a very it gives a good fragrance especially when it is crushed when it is crushed it gives a very good fragrance so it is also related to what the church is going through you can understand because crushing denotes to the suffering so in this in this uh, uh, church also in this letter to the church also the lord says do not be afraid when you go into suffering so when you're crushed you know all the qualities good qualities of the lord jesus christ will come out as a perfume as a fragrance will come out so when a believer is crushed the glory of god is been revealed the characteristics of god is been revealed you know that's very important in suffering uh, it's very important and when you look at the book of exodus you know talking about myrrh we're talking about myrrh this has been used for anointing this is be used for anointing the priest even anointing the priest if you look at the 30th chapter of exodus and i am reading it for you uh, 30th chapter and verse 22 then the lord said to moses take the following fine spices 500 shekels of liquid myrrh half as much that is 250 shekels of fragrant cinnamon and he gives the whole list of there and uh, these things he says in 25th verse use them as a sacred anointing oil he says as a sacred anointing oil so the myrrh is been used for anointing and then secondly we see that the myrrh is been used as embalming we see that when um, jesus was dead and buried uh, we can see that uh, in john's gospel chapter 19 the nicodemus nicodemus comes there in the 19th chapter verse 39 if you look at uh, verse 39 if he says if you uh, sorry uh, joseph comes there not uh, uh, joseph of arimathea comes there and he he says that you know if you look at carefully uh, what is it the word of god says here 19th words uh, sorry 38th words later joseph of arimathea asked pilate for the body of jesus now joseph was a disciple of jesus but secretly uh, uh, secretly because he feared the jewish leaders with the pilate's permission he came and took the body away and he was accompanied by nicodemus there he was accompanied by nicodemus and then the nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh you see that you know why the myrrh is used here is an embalming because if you apply it to the dead body it will not decay soon it will not decay soon so in order to save god the dead body the myrrh is been used those days so uh, looking at uh, looking at uh, smarna the famous product that is been found in smarna is a myrrh which is been used as a fragrance as an anointing oil and also something to embalm the bodies the dead bodies to keep it for a long time but uh, there is one bishop called polycarp in smyrna he was the bishop of smyrna he was burned at the age of 90 can you imagine he was burned at the age of 90 so you can you can see that the entire the church the believers went through a lot of suffering uh, during that period during that period from the period of you know ad 100 onwards until 300 ad they have uh, went through a lot of suffering and I, that's why the lord says you know <coughs> do not fear about this suffering do not fear be faithful he says and this polycarp the bishop said something like this before he died he said over 80 years i have served my lord but not even once has he denied me and how can i deny him today how can i deny him today he says i shall not deny him what a beautiful statement of commitment look at that for 80 years i served him not even once the lord denied me so how can i deny him he says and you know, that's a great commitment for a believer to say as any time the lord left you out without caring for you without loving you without looking at your needs as the lord said no to you any time the bible says in john 637 whoever comes to me i will no wise cast him out i will no wise cast him the lord never 
never left us alone. He never left us alone and he always was with us. And that's the reason why the bishop says here. And I already told you there is no complaint about this church. This church and the church in Philadelphia also, there's no complaint at all. Though they were going through suffering, you can understand that they never murmured, <laughs> which means that they never murmured. They never grumbled. They never complained to God. They never misunderstood the love of God. You know, today, you know, just because we become believers, just because you pray every day, you think, you know, no adverse thing should happen to you. Everything should go well with you. How can it be? You know, sometimes the Lord teaches us lessons by putting us into some adverse situation, into some suffering. That's also out of love. God allows that. But you cannot say, why is the Lord doing this to me? You cannot say, you know, I do not want to suffer like this. The Lord is not loving me at all. You cannot say that, my dear friend. So there's no complaint about this church. And then the Lord reveals himself to the church. How is he Lord revealing to the church? I am the first and I am the last, he says. In the, in, the, in the very eighth verse, we see that. I am the first and the last. I was dead, but now came to life and I'm alive today. You know, I was there from the beginning. I will, there, I will be there forever, the Lord says. Why do you fear? I'm there. I'm not dead and gone. I'm alive today. I'm with you. The Lord says, I'm with you. What an encouragement it is for the church that is going through suffering today. That is going through suffering. And there is a great uh, appreciation for the church, the commendation. We can see a great commendation given to the church. What is the commendation? You know, he says that, you know, you are afflicted. You are poor, <laughs> uh, materialistically poor. And you are persecuted, but yet you are faithful. But you are faithful. Look at that. You know, the church was hit many number of times with the persecution, with the suffering. And they were physically, materialistically very poor, but they never grumbled. They were faithful to the Lord. When I say the church, it is the members of the church we are talking about. In the ninth verse, that's what it says here. Uh, you know, the, the ninth verse says that, I know your afflictions, the Lord says. Look at this, my friends. Whenever we go through some suffering, whenever we go through some humiliation, whenever we go through some problem, don't think the Lord is not aware of it. The Lord says here, I know your affliction. I know what you're going through today. I'm aware of it. And I will do something about it at the right time, the Lord says. I will do something about it at the right time. Don't worry. Don't worry. I will take care of it, but be faithful. <laughs> That's why I told you, and, and when I gave you the outline instruction about the Smyrna church, there were two instructions given. One is, do not fear. And another one is, be faithful. Be faithful. And then now, as I told you, the church went through a lot of suffering, right? Especially in the time of Nero. Nero. You know, they say that almost 60 lakhs of people were burned as lights. Were burned as lights. You can see on the right side of the picture there, the people were tied with uh, some black cloth. It is not a black cloth, actually. It is a kind of a sack that is put in the tar, black tar. You know, we put on the road, the tar, they burn the tar and they dip the sack into that and they wrap it around that person, life. They wrap the live person and they burn him alive. They're burning alive. And they say that, you know, Nero used to sit on his palace and watch these people burn alive. And he would play his fiddle, play his guitar, whatever it is, musical instrument. And he would enjoy when Christians would suffer like that. You know, such kind of suffering, uh, the church in Smyrna, the, the believers in Smyrna went through. My dear friends, India is uh, no, not very far from the suffering. Probably the South India is not that much going through suffering. But we can see North India today. Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, West Bengal, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, you know, Gujarat, Orissa. Some of these uh, states you look at in India, there is so much of persecution going on for the uh, servants of God. For the believers of Jesus Christ. And then they need to stand faithful for the Lord.
you know that's very important and this is what the church has been through in those days and that is the time this particular symbol has come for the christians the symbol of a fish it has come like this you know there is a top curve and a bottom curve half moon on the top half moon at the bottom and that makes a fish you know because there was a threat for all the christians whenever they go to a restaurant or some common place to meet you know either they would draw this picture of the fish on the sand or they would draw it on the uh, table in the restaurant with a with a water whatever they draw this picture when you draw that picture if the person is sitting opposite to you is also a christian he would draw the same picture again <laughs> so that's how they identify themselves as christians but uh, this fish symbol why did this fish symbol has come out of this because there is a the name given in the greek the, for the fish is ichthus ichthus is the name given for the fish the the full form for ichthus is isiosus christos theos heos sotor it's called it's a greek word greek letters are there that means that jesus christ god son and savior jesus christ god son and savior so this is the this is a symbol for christianity when did this come in the nero's time in the nero's time because the christians wanted to safeguard themselves suddenly they should not come in contact with some local person and they get into trouble so they want to know whether the person person sitting next to them or opposite to them is a christian or not they would draw this uh, fish symbol and the other person also will draw the same if he is a christian and that's how they develop the uh, conversation later and then if you look at the uh, second chapter in the letter in the ninth verse it says here i know the slander of those who say that they are jews but they are not jews they are a synagogue of satan he says you know there is a there is a group a cult group that has come up in the church they act as if they are jews but it seems they are not very they are not jews at all there is they, the lord says they are they are a synagogue of jews <laughs> what a what a picture the lord has given what a title the lord has given a synagogue of satan a synagogue of satan you know they talk about faith and good works you now both they want they just don't talk about grace what is the wrong teaching of the jews cults those days the cultish jews what was the wrong teaching that they were making in the church was they don't just believe salvation through grace they also add good works to be done they say to everybody in the church that it is not the grace alone they say that we also need to do some good works in order to be saved in order to go to heaven so they believe in that grace there are two kinds of salvations we see one is a grace oriented salvation another one is man's work oriented effort man's work oriented effort we see that so it's the second one is not the one see we ourselves we cannot strive to be righteous we cannot strive to be holy that's that's the reason why the lord gave this salvation free of cost uh, out of his grace you know if you look at ephesians chapter 2 you know ephesians chapter 2 uh, sorry i didn't put that reference there ephesians chapter 2 i'm reading verse 8 for you i'm reading verse 8 kindly look at that once chapter 2 verse 8 ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 it says for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourself it is the gift of god not by works so that no one can boast <laughs> look at that very 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 clear teaching there paul says it is by grace alone that we are saved but what hap- what is happening there in the smyrna church is there is a group of uh, jews that came up and started talking about a different doctrine it's a cult different doctrine we call it. what is the doctrine they kept the grace aside and they talk they started talking about the good works that everybody has to do in order to attain eternal life in order to attain the salvation of god which is a very wrong teaching so uh, if you should understand every wrong teaching is from satan that's why the lord said they are the synagogue of satan they are the temple of satan god says <laughs> they are the not the temple of the holy spirit 
those Jews who are who are bringing this false news, false teachings, they are the synagogue of Satan. So every heretical teaching, every wrong teaching today is from Satan. You need to understand. And then there is a beautiful, you know, uh, word that mentioned here about the church. What is the Lord saying to the church here? If you look at it here very carefully, he says here, and uh, in the ninth words, you know, I know your afflictions and your poverty. You are, but yet you are rich, he says. <laughs> you know, in the ninth verse, he says that, I know your affli afflictions and your poverty, but yet you are rich. What does that mean? What is the Lord saying about the church is all the members are very poor materialistically. Materially, they are poor. Literally, they are poor people. But they are spiritually rich, they say. The Lord says. Spiritually rich. My dear friends, you know, that is something to be, you know, appreciated. Something to be noted down today. You know, we may not be that rich people, you know, as the world people are. But our riches is in Christ. We are rich because of the Lord Jesus Christ, spiritual. That's what we need to understand. How are we rich? You know, Romans chapter 2 says, we are rich in kindness. And you know, Romans chapter 9 says, we are rich in glory. Romans chapter 11 says, we are rich in wisdom and knowledge. And Ephesians chapter 1 says, we are rich in grace. And Ephesians chapter 118 says, we are rich. There is a richness of glorious inheritance that is kept for us. And then glorious riches in Christ. In the third chapter of Ephesians, Paul talks there. So every believer, materially, materialistically, if you are not even rich, don't worry about that. We have so much of riches that we attained when we accepted Jesus Christ in the Lord Jesus. We have these spiritual riches in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what, you know, the Lord says, do not worry because you are materialistically poor. But he says that you are spiritually rich person, rich person. But there is an instruction. If you look at Romans, I would like to uh, you to turn to Romans because I didn't put that reference here. But I want you to please look at this for a while. Uh, please turn to Romans chapter 15. Uh, here there is a very good instruction given to the believers in Romans. Chapter 15, I'm reading verse 27. I'm reading verse 27. They were pleased to do it and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews spiritual blessing, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. <laughs> Look at that. You know, here what the Lord is saying to the Romans here is, the Christians that are there in the Roman church, the Jews, some of them, they are very poor materialistically. But the Gentiles are very rich materialistically. So what Paul is saying is, those who are rich materialistically should share the riches to the poor who are poor materialistically. <laughs> and then to the Jews who are Christians, Spiritually rich, he says to them, you need to share your spiritual blessings to the spiritually poor people. You need to share your spiritual blessings to them. That's what Paul says there. You know, there is an exchange. You know, the rich people should give it to the poor Christians and the poor uh, Christian believers. You know, they should be able to give their spiritual riches to the people uh, around them. You know, that's a beautiful thing. And then come back to Revelation again, chapter 2. Verse 10 says, a very important thing, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put you, some of you in prison to test you. <laughs> uh, then says here, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Uh, what is this 10 days that, uh, you know, the Lord is talking to John to pass it on to the church in Smyrna? It is not exactly the period of time, 10 days. It's not about the days here. You know, when he's particularly mentioning about the 10 days, he is talking about, you know, the 10 worst Roman emperors period, that is. 
it is a time of 10 worst roman emperor's period so here it says the lord you will suffer persecution in those 10 roman emperor's time worst time of those emperors would you like to know uh, who are those very toughest roman emperors who caused persecution to the church of those days if you look at this these are some of the toughest people the nero is the top man and the domitian tiberius marcus septimius and then we have caligula maximinus diocletian valerian caracalla you know these are they, they, many more roman emperors were there those days but the lord is talking about the coming persecution in the next roman period in the 10 roman periods the lord is talking about the 10 roman periods he just said that 10 days of suffering it's not exactly 10 days it's the 10 roman period of the suffering that they're going to have suffering they're going to have so each emperor that they're going to come under they will go through suffering they will go through suffering that's why we say the church in smyrna is a church that suffered church that suffered and then the 10th verse, 10th verse says uh, at the last the part of the 10th verse says be faithful even to the point of death and i will give you life as your victor's crown there are two types of crowns in the bible we see not only the bible but in general you know when you talk about the uh, stephanus stephanus is a victor's crown the olympic games you get this crown we call it stephanos stephanos is in one crown and the ruling crown is diadema so the victor's crown is talking about is stephanos you have taken victory over the suffering you'll get this and the diadema is the one that the lord wears it the lord jesus has the ruling crown of diadema of course we also rule but we don't rule with the crowns we put our crowns at the feet of the lord <laughs> at the feet of the lord we see that in later uh, in our study later in our study we see that even in the you know fifth chapter also we see that later on when we come to our study so what do we do with all the crowns that we get there are so many crowns mentioned in the bible you know uh, the, un, uh, the uncorrupted crown glorious crown and all that crown of glory and all that uh, i don't want to mention now all these crowns but we get all those crowns but we don't wear one crown over the other and try to balance them no we don't try to wear all the crowns at once the moment we get a crown we put it at the feet of the lord because we realize it is because of the lord we are there in heaven because of the lord so we are grateful to the lord we want to worship him the way that he led us all these years uh, in our life here on earth in all the persecutions and ups and downs the lord was with us and now he has brought us to heaven giving us this crown as an appreciation as a reward for all of us for what we have done and then now what is the what is the reward in the 11th verse a beautiful reward is mentioned the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death what is this second death you know what is this second death if you look at uh, revelation chapter 20 please turn to revelation chapter 20 and i would like to read verse uh, 14 verse 14 then death and hades were thrown into the lake of fire the lake of fire is the second death. <laughs> Look at that. So the Lord says to the church in Smyrna that you will not taste the second death. Second death means it's a lake, lake of fire. It's a hell. He's talking in other words, it's a hell, lake of fire. So that's the second death he's talking about. There is a, there is a instruction to all of us today as we look at this. Uh, in the 14 verse, we've already seen it's a lake of fire. Twice born, you will die once. If you are born only once, you have to die twice. <laughs> you understand the logic in this? If you are born twice, you will die only once. But if you are born only once, you will die twice. What does that mean? 
twice born means we have a spiritual birth and we have a spiritual and also physical birth both births first we are born physically out of the mother's womb that is the physical birth and then later when you come to know the lord personally you accept him as your personal savior and lord of your life that is a rebirth born again we call it john 3:3 3. unless you are born again you know john says so that is the spiritual birth so there are two births in everybody's life a, a physical birth and a spiritual birth if you have experienced both these births then you will not get this second death <laughs> you will die only once what is that first death that is a physical death you will only die physically but you will not die spiritually that means you will not get into lake of fire you will not get into the lake of fire you will not get into the lake of fire so that's the thing that we are looking at and uh, this is one truth that we always have to remember and another thing we have to remember only once you are born that means only physically you are born you need to die twice that means there is a physical death for you and there is also a spiritual death for you so my dear friends the question is now to you do you are you born twice are you born both physically and spiritually the lord says to the church in smarna you will never taste the second death which is a lake of fire and uh, hell you will never taste that because you have already taken two births so you will have only one death that is a physical death so my dear friends i want to ask you this question this evening are you born again <laughs> do you have two births or not if you are only born once that is physically and you do not have this spiritual birth experience you i want to tell you you may have to experience hell that's the second death i'm sorry about that but before you die you better be born again you better accept the lord jesus christ as your personal savior and there's always be blessing to you always a blessing to you so i would now just stop it here for a while